we are being recorded. Um, let's, let's open with prayer. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we are grateful. We are so grateful for this ability, this technology that allows us to gather together to hear and see one another and to learn together. It's not the best thing. It's not what we want. We want to see each other in person. But in these days, in order to be safe, we're so grateful for the opportunity to gather in this way. Be with us, help us ask questions that lead us to better understanding. Be with Lisa as she shares her experience and how she has gathered this knowledge through years of professional work. We're grateful for her ability to be with us today. Be with us, help us make decisions that are good in your sight and that build up your people each and every day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I am so pleased to introduce to you a colleague of mine and somebody I look forward to seeing in person one day. Yes, <laughs> Lisa, ma'am. Lisa, all good. Uh, Lisa is the Transitional Presbytery Leader for the Presbytery of Cincinnati and a commissioned ruling elder. But before God called her into this work, she did something else, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce it because every time I try, it comes out different. So Lisa, thank you for joining us and for being willing to share your amazing expertise as we get this update on COVID. I am happy to. Cindy, thank you for having me, and thank you all of you for coming. You're actually in my favorite part of the world. So I grew up in New York City, but spent a lot of time um, in New England for various reasons, skiing, hiking, and then, um, as you'll hear a little bit of my background, actually working at, in Brattleboro, Vermont, and Keene, New Hampshire for a, a small company there by way of Procter & Gamble. I am an immunocytochemist by training. I graduated from the University of Medicine and Dentistry back in 1985. I'm an East Coast kid, and I spent 36 years in the pharmaceutical industry. The first couple of years of that was running a an instrument called a flow cytometer that really looked at the immune cells of the human system and how they responded to different kinds of insults, whether it was uh, a parasite or a virus or a bacteria. And so back, this was back before the era of personal computers. Yes, I am that old. Um, I had a cray, which was awesome. Uh, and I, someday, I should, Cindy, I'll send you a picture of my machine because it's really, it looks like Star Wars. Um, but I did work with two specific viruses. One was a rhinovirus, so the virus, one of the viruses that causes the common cold. And the other one was then known as HTLV3 or 4 and it became HIV. So I did a lot of viral work back then. Um, I figured out very quickly I was way too social a person to spend the rest of my life in a little dark lab all by myself. So I moved into clinical research, a lot of uh, first dose and, and then much later testing in man, the kinds of things you're hearing about the vaccine testing now and then spent the next um, probably 30 years or so working with clinical studies and then working with boards of health in five different continents. So working with the FDAs of other, other countries. Um, and it was, it was an awesome career, I loved it. I, this is my third failed retirement. Um, I actually intended to stay retired after the third time, but um, then the presbytery called and said, for three months, can you keep the lights on? And 18 months later, I'm still here. So we're having fun. Um, but anyway, I wanted to share with you a little bit about COVID um, as a virus we can talk about and I'm willing to answer any questions that I can. If I don't know the answer, I'll go see if I can figure it out for you. Um, I can talk about the infectivity, the symptoms, the fatality rates, the um, other conditions that are emerging outside of fatality. We can talk about, um, we can talk about your specific region because I did go online this morning and look to see where every single one of your counties are. We can talk about current treatments and where they're coming. We can talk about children um, because everybody's facing going back to school right now. And then we can talk about the vaccines, what we're seeing in immunity from innate immunity and where the vaccination process is. So I'm gonna start with the virus itself. Coronavirus is not, this is not the first coronavirus we've seen. There are four coronaviruses that just cause common colds. They're very mild, they're infectious, but they're not very virulent, which means they don't cause a lot of disease. You've heard about two others that we've had as, as I will call the minimal pandemics, 
the SARS uh, virus that came out of Singapore, and then the MERS virus that came out of the Middle East. They were very highly virulent. They caused really serious illness. They were pretty infectious. They caused a very high degree of fatality, and then they petered out. They just, they just uh, did, not, did not continue to infect. So um, that's not what we're facing with this virus. This virus is highly infectious. It is highly virulent. It is um, not highly fatal, however, which is a good thing. And as we watch younger um, people get infected, the fatality rate actually goes down. Fatality rate with this virus is almost completely correlated to age and other comorbid conditions. But because it's so infectious, it is going to be around for a long period of time. This is one, not one that is going to go away. This is likely a virus we're going to be living with for a very long time. Um, it's going to be one of those ones that is there at a low level once we get vaccinations to a certain level, but we're going to be dealing with this for a while, so don't throw your masks away. Um, the infectiousness of this virus is actually quite insidious because 40% of the people who are infected do not show symptoms. And so you don't know if you're in, against or, or dealing with somebody who is in fact infectious but just isn't displaying symptoms. There was a study that came out actually just at the end of last week everything that we had seen so far had said that people are actually at their most infectious when be, just before they get symptoms. So, and that was estimated about two days. Data is now coming out that says you can be infectious for eight days before you actually show symptomology, even if you're going to get symptomology. So this is a very, very insidious, very strange disease. I, um, my niece today just had to cancel her wedding to next year said, it's just a rude virus. You never know what it's going to do. I said, it has no manners whatsoever. It's uh, about three times the infectivity of other respiratory viruses the way you know it. It's, um, it's scary because uh, the amount of, or the, let's see, the, the um, what do I want to say here? The chances of you getting infected are predicated on two factors. The number of virus particles you're exposed to and the amount of time that you're exposed to them. The point of maximum chance that you will get infected if you're across from someone who's infectious is only 15 minutes. It's really short. And so as you start to think about talking about congregations going back into a sanctuary, even if it's only for 30 minutes, you've just doubled the maximum chance of you being infected. So this is a very, very scary virus. It's not known whether this virus becomes latent if you think about something like the chicken pox virus that stays in your body after you've been exposed to it and then reemerges later as shingles, it's not known whether this virus is going to do the same thing. We just haven't had enough experience with it. It's also not known because so many people are either asymptomatic or show mild symptoms, whether or not you can actually become reinfected with the virus. Also not known, not proven. Um, right now, the U.S., as you probably read, has hit 5 million cases. Uh, that's 1 million cases more in the last 17 days. So again, the infection rate of this virus as it, as it moves exponentially has become faster and faster and faster. And so it's why you're seeing governors start to shut things back down and you see a lot of uh, admonitions of wear your mask. So wear your mask. Um, it is airborne. It is, it is one that you can, you can get by touching a surface and then getting it in the mucus of your face but it only lasts about three to four days on an impermeable surface, like a, a piece of wood or a piece of metal, and it only lasts about one to two days on a permeable surface, like a hymnal or a piece of paper. So things to consider, as you, again, as you think about reopening sanctuaries, um, that kind of thing. Um, symptomology is all over the place. It is, in, it is inhaled as a respiratory virus, but it doesn't stop there. It can affect the GI system, it affects the cardiac system, it, it, it affects blood vessels, causing clots in the smallest vessels in your body, which is very unusual. It obviously affects the lungs. The scariest part about this one is, is we've learned two things in the last couple of months. Clearly it was getting into the central nervous system because one of the, one of the pivotal cardinal symptoms is loss of taste, loss of smell, that's central nervous system functioning. But we've also begun to see this, the, the virus actually cross the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain. The other thing that this virus does, and depends on uh, what your baseline health is, it can cause, like many viruses, something that's called a cytokine storm. A cytokine is a chemical that the immune cells in your body put out, 
it can actually cause a hyperimmune response. And that hyperimmune response is partly what begins to shut organs down, liver, kidney, um, it causes damage to the heart, it causes damage to the lungs, it can also cause damage in the brain. And so we're seeing not only strokes because of the, car, of the vascular effects, but we're also seeing seizures, we're seeing loss of cognitive function, and we're seeing permanent neurologic damage. One of the most recent studies that came out shows that it also affects the islet cells of the pancreas. So not only is diabetes a predisposing condition, it can actually cause diabetes. And so this is not a virus you want to mess with. This is a nasty one. And because it's so infectious and because it's not going to go away, this is one that you really do have to take some precautions on. As I, as I said, the, um, the fatality rate is not great. The fatality rate is about 1%. That's 10% um, um, higher than the flu virus. It's about five times lower than Ebola. So you put that sort of bracket around it. And it, like I said, it is directly correlated to age. So it's about 300 out of 1,000 if you're 85 and above. It's about 0.3 out of 1,000 if you're zero to 18. And it sort of goes on that exponential curve. However, and here's sort of the scariest statistics. We've only known about this virus now for about eight to nine months. So we don't know exactly where it's going to go. But for every one death, there are another 19 people that have to be hospitalized. So you can start to see the cost to the healthcare system that this is going to bring. For every one death, there are 18 people that will have long-term or permanent heart damage. For every one death, there are 10 people who will have long-term or permanent lung damage. And I have seen CAT scans of young cross-country runner females, some of the healthiest people in the country, and they have permanent what they call ground glass damage to the bottom of their lungs because of the way this virus um, manifests itself. For every one person who dies, there will be three strokes. For every one person who dies, there will be two who have permanent neurological deficits, and there will be another two who have permanent or long-term cognitive dysfunction. So this causes extreme comorbid conditions. Um, again, not one to mess with. I saw a question on chat, so I wanna make sure I address that one. Uh, length and level of exposure. Yes, so older health history is definitely another factor. Um, the most vulnerable are those who have cardiovascular disease, lung disease, especially if they've had part of their lung removed, um, if, they're, if they are a current oncologic patient, if they're immunosuppressed in any way, so if they're taking uh, a steroid or uh, oncology drugs for anything, um, they will be much, much more susceptible to getting symptomology uh, along, along with infectivity. So I hope that answered your question. I just wanna take a second to yep. um, make sure you got some of those significant pieces of information that it only takes 15 minutes of exposure, 15 minutes. That's important. That you can be symptomatic up to eight days before, but you can be infectious. shedding the virus, yes. infectious right. for up to eight days before you show symptoms. So right. that could be two Sundays. Right. That could be two different Sundays. And that 40% of people who are infected show no symptoms at all or very mild symptoms? No symptoms at all or such mild symptoms that you wouldn't even necessarily think of it as COVID. Um, so, and a lot of it is, you know, the cardinal symptoms that you've all heard about, fever, cough. Um, some people just get a little tickle. Um, and, and they may have it for two months, but they don't think of that as anything other than, gee, I've had a dry throat. Um, fever is not actually one of the most prevalent symptoms for the for those who are really really mild. Wow! So that I mean, for those of us who get our temperature taken before going to the doctor's office or even some of our congregations, that's right. not necessarily a safeguard. It is not predictive of whether or not you are infected. That's true. And that's you know the question always comes up is well should I get tested? Well, if you think about the tests are getting better, they're getting um, shorter in terms of being able to give you a response, but that test is only that specific point in time. So at first when these tests came out, it was up to a week in some cases, but on general three to four days before you actually got your result, you got three or four days to actually get infected. 
by the time you get the answer that said, hey, you're clear, but you don't know that you are. Um, in Cincinnati, we have churches that, like yours, run the gamut. I have big churches in the city, big churches in the suburbs, and then we go all the way out into the edge of Appalachia. We go into southeastern Indiana, and we go into Kentucky. And so I've got some real rural churches as well. And I've got one in Indiana. I love them to death. They're 12 people. They've been together forever. Um, and they literally wanted to go worship in the cornfield. And their response to me, this was really early on, but we're so isolated. And so my question to them was, do you go to Kroger's? You know, do you go grocery shopping? Well, of course, then you're not isolated. Do you go buy gas? You're not isolated. Do you go to the doctor? You're not isolated. And so, you know, we tend to forget that every interaction actually becomes a chance and I'm exaggerating to make the point, but every interaction becomes a chance to be infected. We had a, there was a doctor's call a couple of weeks ago at CDC, and um, I listened into it just because I was curious as to what they would say. And the one thing that I took away that actually floored me, I hadn't thought of it this way, is if you're meeting with 10 people um, and you're not masked, even if you're socially distanced, and each one of them has also met with 10 people, you just met with 100 people. And I had never really thought of it that way, but it was very powerful in terms of how quickly this can, this can really evolve. So we have a question about um, how long it takes between exposure and a positive result on the test. Yeah, and so that a little bit depends on the test. Um, probably the question, the answer to every question you ask, we'll, we'll start with, it depends. Depends on the, on the type of the test. If it is looking for um, RNA virus, uh, uh, particles, which is what the virus sheds in the body, that's the most predictive test. Um, and it can take up to two to three days before you can, you can actually see viral shedding. Um, the antibodies that are produced are pre take longer. And so you can be infected with, with an antibody test for a couple of days, probably up to a week before the antibodies actually start showing up in the test. And somebody put the CDC link up there as well. Yeah, thank you. I know one so of the, the questions, the go the ahead. RNA is the nasal swab test? Yes, so this virus is essentially, it's called messenger RNA. It's a single strand of RNA, which is the genetic code for the virus inside a sack of fat and protein. I mean, you've all seen the pictures, right? It's a blob with these little spikes coming off of it. Exactly, it looks scary. Those spikes that are coming off are the proteins. And so as we get into the vaccination, the vaccination development, that's the way that a lot of the vaccines are developed to identify that protein so that they can then disrupt the cell in, into which that protein has been absorbed. Um, other, the other vaccines are really looking at trying to find those mRNA fragments. Um, I mean, we don't even consider back viruses alive and yet look what they do to people. It's amazing, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it is, it is so much information. And, and as you said, we've only known about COVID-19 since the end of December 2019. Yeah. It has yeah. the 19 number on it. And there's so much we don't know yet. Well, and, you know, that's one of the, I think, hopeful things about this. Um, I've never seen pharmaceutical companies and researchers around the world do so much open source data sharing because they have to. Um, most of the time, coming from the pharmaceutical industry, you keep what you're doing fairly close to the vest so that your data is protected when you take it to a board of health for approval. That's not happening. Um, this, this stuff is being published very, very quickly and, and truly out on open source. Um, you know, Journal of American Medical Association, the New England Journal of, Medic of Medicine, some of the premier journals are just pushing it out there so that people see what's going on. So that actually has helped a lot. And everything from the etiology of the virus, the epidemiology of the virus, the sequelae that they're seeing, the treatments that they're seeing that are working and not working, um, because there's obviously a lot of stuff out there on social media as well. And then also the entire vaccine development is really, um, you know, it's, it's amazing how much data is out there in a short period of time. Let's talk a little bit about kids and, you know, school and uh, several churches, many churches across the country, of course, have preschools or childcare centers. Yeah. What's the word? <laughs> So um, you know, a couple of things. Kids 
um, because their immune systems aren't as fully developed and have they haven't just by nature of the number of years they've been on earth haven't been exposed to as many things as someone who is older their response to the virus for the most part tends to be not as severe as it is for older adults and that's twofold one is their innate immune system the other is they don't have the comorbid conditions that a more older person has um, so they present with milder symptoms they present with some of the non-classic symptoms they tend to get fevers but they may not develop all of the other symptoms um, right now they're less than five percent of the u.s cases uh, in the zero to 18 age so that's what you call a child at this point the those that are showing symptomatology tend to have their own underlying disease of some kind something that is making them immunosuppressed or they have some other um, some other underlying medical condition um, the same guidances are in place for kids as they are for adults wear masks wash your hands physically distance as much as you can limit the number of things that are touched and that are shared which you know if you think about a kindergartner good luck with that that's all i can say um, they do however present those that get ill have presented with some very scary and very unusual um, hyperimmune responses it's called a multi-symptom multi-system inflammatory um, syndrome so i was trying to get the it's m-i-s-c-s um, and it actually mimics something called Kawasaki disease, which, which is a genetic disease, but it can cause serious neurologic damage. And so it, again, even in little ones, it's not something you wanna mess with. You know, as, as kids go back to school, and I know my stepdaughter is a, is a high school teacher down in North Carolina, even with the kids that she deals with, she said trying to get them to understand the difference between what they're used to doing socially and then putting them in a structured classroom where you can physically distance is the problem. So, you know, putting them out on a recess playground if they're young or, or having a party on a Saturday night if they're 18, that's where the danger comes from. And it tracks very much to the kinds of community spread that you're seeing even in adults. Um, the upticks that we saw as states started to open back up really weren't about the racial tension protests, at least here in Cincinnati, most of those were masked. Um, they're really not about increases in testing. They were about people opening themselves back up to small gatherings, wedding showers, um, funerals, church settings, weddings, that kind of thing, parties. Um, and that's really where the spread has come from. So the same, that same caution in trying to keep kids down and not going up and hugging their best friend on the playground because that's what they've always done. Um, has that's going to be the toughest part of kids. So it's you know it manifests itself more mildly for the most part unless there's a reason underlying medical condition. But the same issues are going to be in place. Make sure um, make sure that they mask. Make sure that they they keep themselves clean. Make sure that the surfaces around them are clean. I just saw something in chat that I'm going to address as well. Yeah. Um, Somebody, Carla got an antibody test yesterday, did not have COVID before. It actually doesn't. So it depends on whether or not you had significant symptoms. And I'm gonna to exaggerate to make the point, if you were on a respirator in the ICU for 28 days, the, the antibody response to this virus, the natural antibody response to this virus is very mild and very weak. And so if you're one of those 40% of the people who had no symptoms, your antibodies probably aren't going to show up after about two weeks because you really didn't develop very many. If you had significant symptomology, then they've shown that antibodies can be detected three to four months later. Um, but again, the immune response, the innate immune response is not weak and it's, it is weak and it doesn't last long. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you've never had COVID. That too is a little bit of a test in time. Wow, wow. Yeah. So again, back to, and someone else put in the chat that's with the schools that have reopened, because a lot of schools start back in August, Right. the number of cases among kids is starting to go yep. up. Yes. Um, you know, even if, even if their illness isn't as severe, you still have those initial realities, 15 minutes, Right. In an enclosed space. And of course, <laughs> I mean, how, how do you go to school for only 15 minutes? How are you right. in a classroom 
for only 15 minutes. So 15 right. minutes in an enclosed space, up to eight days of being infectious before symptoms and 40% right. um, not yeah, showing that, anything. Yeah. That, that uh, picture that came out a couple of days ago of the crowded, crowded hallway in Georgia, I mean, out of that, just out of that one school, they've already quarantined 80 families. Because they weren't masked and they were, I mean, think about the way schools are constructed. They're, they're meant to constrict you from a, you know, from a hallway to a locker to a classroom and then back again. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it is going to be very, very tough. And honestly, it's going to be harder as it gets colder, um, you know, maybe not so much in the South. We've talked a lot in Cincinnati about um, do you air condition? Do you have ceiling fans? Do you not? Um, and I've had people come back and I'm not an HVAC expert, but I did a lot of looking into it. And I've had people say, you know, I've got this awesome HEPA filter, or I've got a UV screen that the virus will pass through. And my answer to that is that's great for about the first 10 seconds that air exits. And then think about what air conditioning or heat does. It pushes down on the congregation and then circles. And so right now there's only one study, but it's, it's actually a very, re um, representative study. It's a restaurant in Wuhan, which is where the virus was originated. Um, it was a closed system. There was no fresh ventilation through, but the air conditioning was on. It was just circling in this little restaurant. And they literally mapped the one infected person to the nine infected person all around him because the air was circulating. So heat and air conditioning and even ceiling fans recycle exhaled air. That's what they do. And eventually it makes it back up to that HEPA filter, but otherwise it cycles around for a little while. And so when heat starts to become an issue, that's where being indoors is going to be a real problem. Because the other reality of the spread of this virus is a matter of simple physics. Because it's airborne, the smaller those airborne particles are, which means the drier they are, the further they go. So in heat and humidity, it's partly why the flu, flu dissipates in the summer. They, it's bigger particles because of more humidity, it falls faster and it doesn't go as fast. Um, so, so heat in the winter is gonna be a bigger problem in terms of spread. Yeah. I think the other thing that we talk about in a congregational setting, and this is gonna be true in a school too, um, is singing. You've, you've all seen all the admonitions not to sing. Think of a sing, think of singing as a four minute sustained cough. A cough is 50 miles an hour. A sneeze is 200 miles an hour, in case you didn't know that one. Um, you get all kinds of trivia in this little talk. But 50 miles an hour for four minutes will travel at least 18 to 24 feet. So that six foot distance that everybody keeps talking about is not nearly enough. Um, and so that's one of the reasons you've seen choir and choir rehearsals um, become an issue. A mask works. Um, Cindy, if you don't have this, on my Facebook page is actually a great video of a guy who showed up to two feet how much a simple mask will block um, and it's really really effective and it's even more effective if you've both got masks on it doesn't say you can get two feet from one another but um, but it really does help you know singing with masks again it will help um, as a singer it's really hard to take that breath in though because your mask sort of occludes any air that you're going to get it's better than nothing, but I would still say distance. I mean, um, here in Cincinnati, we are blessed to have the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. And so we have a lot of our opera students go into our congregations to sing. Most of our congregations now have one or two at a time. They're masked for the entire service until they get up to sing. And then they're actually 18 to 24 feet apart and they, they tend to face away from each other. And of course we're Presbyterians, nobody sits in the front row. So you're at least 20 feet away from the first congregant as well. <laughs> oh, but even even in that scenario you still have the issue of air circulation and right. the virus hanging in the air and exactly and moving out so so what we've been telling people here is if you must be indoors or if you are indoors and you have to air condition you can't open the windows air condition the room for 24 hours before the congregation walks in and then turn it off Okay. So the air is cool, but you're not circulating it. Okay. And the same might be true for heat. So that's, that is an option okay. that keeps people comfortable without having, without being, having them exposed to circled air. Gotcha. So we have a couple questions about outdoor gatherings in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, so outdoor, actually, we have a number of our churches that are outdoor worshiping. What an awesome witness to your neighbors. I mean, I think this is probably one of the best stunningly simple things we might have realized in the world. Um, 
yes, so outside is great, especially if people are bringing their own chairs, bringing their own communion elements, printing off their own bulletins. Again, you're limiting the number of things that are being touched. Um, you know, the collection plates are on a table somewhere so that people aren't passing that as well. Um, and your distance, you know, six to eight to 12 feet. If you've got bigger space and you can do that, it's fabulous. I have two churches that are actually, that have since March gone back to car worship where people don't get out of their cars, they stay in the car. The church has rented an FM station and they broadcast it on the FM station. And that's been beautiful because people can wave at each other out of the cars. And that's been a really cool thing. So, um, so there are lots of ways to do it without necessarily opening up a sanctuary if you've got the space for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, just checking. Uh... What else we got? So, so one question in the chat is the bottom line, don't restart worship or other church activities, I'm assuming in the building until a vaccine is proven to be effective. Yeah, that's a tough one. So, um, so let, me, let me do two things really fast. I'll talk about the treatments that are available that are actually bringing down the amount of time people are hospitalized when they are and some of the fatality rates. Um, actually, what they found is sort of three things. Um, First of all, convalescent plasma, plasma of people who have had antibodies is not proving to be useful, partly because those antibodies are so weak. That was a big hope early on. What they found is if you hit, it, hit the viral symptoms at two different times, you can actually significantly reduce the amount of time that you are symptomatic and the amount of time that you're in hospital. Most of the people who are being treated are already hospitalized. If you start out early in the, in the process with an immuno, um, an immune booster, an antiviral like remdesivir, it will actually decrease the amount of virus that can be reshed in the body. So it, it takes the amount of virus in the body out. Later in the system, to keep the immune um, response at a, not at a minimum, but at a reasonable level, so you don't get into that cytokine storm, if you give an immunosuppressant like dexamethasone, if you give a steroid, then you can actually balance the viral shed and the immune system to the point where the body has its best chance of healing. The other thing they found is literally turning someone on their stomach because it actually clears the lungs faster. So simple positioning can actually improve recovery time. Um, and that's, I mean, some really simple things that have come up with that. The vaccines that are, um, that are being developed, there are, yeah, wear a mask everywhere, exactly, at all times. Um, and wash your hands and do all the things that your grandmother told you to do anyway. That's right. Um, there, are, there are five uh, vaccines that the U.S. has heavily subsidized in, under something called Operation Warp Speed. There are two more now that have come under that. There are three different kinds of vaccines in development. They're all in slightly different phases, but everything that now has gone into what's called phase three clinical trusting, which is the very large scale tens of thousands of patient clinical trials are actually showing some promise. Um, and the promise is this, they're producing antibodies, but they're also producing T cell response in the body. So the immune system in the body has two different kinds of what we call T cells. They, they derive from the thymus, that's why they're called T cells. One is a helper cell, which is basically helps the immune system to recognize a virus that it's seen before or a bacteria that it's seen before. The other one is called a T killer cell. And it's the one that creates the response that actually goes after the infected cells to kill the cells and stop the viral shed. Mm -hmm. So what they're showing is that the vaccines that they're developing are improving the T cell response as well. So it's improving the system on both sides. All vaccines do this, but they do it in different levels. And since the antibody response to this still appears to be weak, and what they're seeing in the vaccinations is that they can boost it, um, this is actually looking pretty good. So there are two that have gone into phase three trials, one from Moderna, one from Pfizer. They are based on the actual mRNA of the virus. So it's the uninfectious part of the virus, but it's enough to prime the immune system to recognize the whole virus. The downside of that is that, first of all, the, the vaccine has to be kept at minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So it has to be like uber frozen, which is really tough on transport and on delivery. The other part of that is that there's never been an mRNA vi uh, vaccine that's been commercialized. So this is a very, very new kind of vaccination technology. 
The other two kinds are to take another type of virus and attach to that virus, which is, which is infectious but not virulent. So an adenovirus, or there's another one called a, a vesicular stomatis virus. Attach the coronavirus protein to it and then put that into an adjuvant, something that boosts the immune response and use that as the vaccine. That's the very typical um, vaccination kind of stuff that you get for mumps, rubella, all that kind of stuff. Um, Sanofi, GSK, GlaxoSmithKline have an attenuated virus and an adjuvant that they've now put into uh, phase three trials. Novavax has one that's been put into phase three trials. They're all looking very good. The first company I ever worked for is Merck Sharp and Dome back east. They are a vaccine powerhouse. They are the ones who did the HPV virus, um, the shingles virus. They got they did the original mumps, rubella, all of that kind of thing. They actually last year in, in December of 2019 were approved for a vaccine for Ebola. It's the only one that exists. And so they're actually using that technology to see if they can create a vaccine, a vaccine for coronavirus. And so they're a little bit behind, but um, I know them, they are, they are very careful about the way that they do it. So they're, they're actually on record as saying, we're okay if we're behind. Most of these vaccines will require a booster. Um, one of them could be oral, sort of like the polio vaccine. One of them, J&J &J and Merck's, are both, are both intended to be single doses. This virus doesn't mutate very fast, which means one vaccine may do it, but because the immune response is weak, you still may need to have a vaccination every year. So the flu virus requires a, vaccina a vaccination every year for a different reason. This one might just be to keep the boost up. Wow. So still learning that. Um, but it does, it does really look quite good. I've seen estimates, you know, of course, again, social media. Um, we're going to have it by the election? Probably not. Um, but I would expect by first quarter of next year, you will probably have a vaccine available and approved. Um, and it, it, then what's going to have to happen is the rubric of who gets it first. Mm -hmm. It's most likely going to be the elderly, frontline workers, healthcare workers, especially those who are in nursing homes, things like that. Yeah. So most of us on this call will not be the first to get the vaccine. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can expect that most of your congregation will not likely get it until mid to fall of next year. Yeah. And so for your planning purposes, um, you know, what you're looking for when you develop a vaccine, it's not about mitigating the amount of virus any individual get it's about mitigating the the amount that the population gets and so herd immunity is 70 percent of the population has some degree of immunity not that they're perfectly um, protected and so i've seen estimates from 50 to 70 for these vaccines um, everybody on record at cdc has said 50 percent would be good so they will go with a lower epidemiologic immunity just to start getting it out there and to that herd immunity, and there's a question in the chat about this. Some people have said, you know, we should all just we should all just get sick. We should all get exposed. But part of what I think I hear you saying is that because the antibody response is not as strong, that actually wouldn't necessarily lead to immunity. Right. And actually, Sweden proved that out for us. So early on, when this went through Europe. Um, Europe was one of the mutations of the original virus out of China. So the, the, in the US, the virus that hit Seattle, which was sort of our first hotspot, actually came from China. The one that hit the East Coast, that hit New York and where you are, uh, Boston, that area, Washington, came out of Europe. And it was a more infectious, more virulent form of the virus. Sweden decided they were going to go the herd immunity route. So they did not physically distance. They didn't mask. They didn't put, um, didn't put any precautions in place. And they have the highest per capita death rate of any country in Europe. And they've admitted it was a medical failure. So, so just allowing yourself to be exposed is not, not a good idea. Again, think about the number of people that you could expose. It, you've probably seen the R number that's been touted. That basically means a reinfection number. So when the R number is above one, it means the virus is actively spreading because you're infecting at least one other person. When this hit New York at the very early days, the R factor was four. And this is an exponential number. So if I'm infected, I'm going to infect four of you and then four of you are gonna infect four others. And I've just filled up the first Zoom block within one round of infection. Yeah, yeah. 
And yes, it is questionable if UV moves in, in moving air, it doesn't. It's also very um, specific as to what type of UV is, is useful against this type of viral coat and the mRNA. And the other part of that is, depending on what type of UV turns out to be useful, it disrupts your own DNA as well. So it can be just as dangerous to you as it is to the virus, which is why you're told to wear sunscreen outside. So, I mean, these kinds of things, there's no, there's no one shot answer to this. There really isn't. And, and I think that would be the same. There are questions about, you know, older churches, heating systems, air conditioning systems, just the simple architecture of a church will change the answer. Just the how the church is set up and how the air is brought through. And uh, one person is asking if, if there are experts who can work with churches on, on air filtration in this. Is that possible? <laughs> yes, um, but again, you know, it, it's only as good as the air that emerges from the filter and then what it does after that is really what you need. The, the best thing you can do and the one thing most of our churches can't do is leave the windows open and just allow for a single stream of air um, that only flows in one direction and is constantly replenished. Okay, okay. Wow, lots Yeah, I know, and I'm, I'm the absolute harbinger of joy, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> it's important, you know, for, for congregational leaders to, to have information. And that's been one of the challenges is how to get the information, understand the information, because a lot of it is so very technical. And then how to apply the information. How do we apply this as our sessions and pastors, as our communities make decisions? Right. And I know, so, you know, my presbytery is probably tired of me pushing data out to them. And I will tell you, you know, we, we do have three, states, so three governors that I have to sort of keep track of, mm -hmm. but Governor DeWine did us a favor. He actually now has color-coded um, a risk level, and I'll, I'll um, put in the chat an, another website that you can go to that does a similar thing. Governor DeWine's task force did it on seven key indicators, and there are um, basically four levels of color. So I put something out to the sessions and the pastors not too long ago that said, you know, make the Governor DeWine your bad guy, because if you're red or purple, which is the two highest, and, and you can back that up on objective, data-driven, non-judgmental, non-social media information, use that as your criteria. It's not foolproof. And I think the really painful part for the sessions in particular that I've seen is this is not a one and done decision. You know, as soon as you get down to orange or yellow and you say, hey, we can open, you could go back up to red the next week. And it, so this is, this is an ongoing, very fluid situation. The debates that you're going to have are gonna go that way too. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the easiest answer, and I, I hate to say this because I know this isn't what congregations want to hear. The easiest answer is to stay close and stay virtual until, yes. until we have some level of comfort that this is controlled. Because in the United States, this is not a controlled spread at this point. No. Um, you guys, I, the, the website is COVID Act Now. I'll put, I'll put it in the chat. It does the same thing and you can search county by county. Um, so it will, it will pull up a US map, you hit your state and then you can go to, there you go, COVID Act Now, thank you. Um, you can go county by county and it will give it to you on five different um, data points. For, and I looked you guys up, for the most part, You've got slow growth, not completely, but slow growth, unless you're in a city situation. Um, and even like the Boston area, you actually are in pretty good shape. What really works for urban areas is you have so many hospitals that you're not going to overrun your ICU beds. That starts to go the other way when you get into rural counties where the ICU beds are not as prevalent. So if you've got spread, what will turn you into orange and red faster than anything else is the fact that you're about to over, overrun your ICU. Yeah. As I started to look out for some of the presbyteries in Kansas, that's what's making them red. It's not the spread, it's the ICU bed utilization. So that kind of data can be very objective and very helpful as you're starting to make decisions, particularly if you've got congregants who are vulnerable, who are you know, have comorbid conditions, who are 65 and above. My daughter reminded me that I was about to turn 63. So 
Yeah, which so is there most I am. of our, our churches. Um, exactly. Sang has his hand up. So Sang, yes. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Which, there yeah, you go. I since, uh, <clears throat> so it's air conditioned uh, sanctuary, right? And you're saying that one side, uh, for us, it's sort of a, uh, we, we, don't only, we, we don't have a windows both sides. So but you saying that only has a one side of window is actually better than both sides of window? No, both sides is best. If you can really get continual airflow through. Um, and it sort of depends on where your windows are. That might be a place where you have someone come to really look at airflow. If, if the breeze can work through the windows um, and that's sufficient to keep the sanctuary cool, that's better than having it closed and air conditioned. Because what the air conditioning does is it just recycles the internal air. Um, it, you know, if you've got a door that opens opposite the windows, that works, that kind of thing will work. Yeah. And I saw there was another thing on the chat too. So Kang Tang, did that answer your question? Thumbs up? It back up so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, any any fresh air that you can let in is better than recycled air um, in any way, shape, or form. If the air doesn't cycle through, um, you'd have to look at that. Somebody raised the question about, you know, I've got a sanctuary, I've got 25 people, and I've got a bunch of churches that are huge, old, beautiful churches that hold 550 people can easily distance in there. But the question that was asked on chat is salient. I've told churches to absolutely limit access to any other part of the building. So people come in for worship, they go to the sanctuary, and then they leave and they don't go to the fellowship hall and they don't go to the offices and they don't go to the Sunday school classes because then you have to sanitize every single one of those. The question has rightly come up. If I've got my sanctuary open, people are there for an hour. I'm not repurposing air. They leave and I close it and nobody else goes in there for seven days. Am I clear? And the answer is probably yes. I mean, you know, I'm not sure. I would still clean things, but, um, but I think that's probably fair. Bathrooms are a tough one because lots of things get touched and those are a lot of impermeable top, you know, metals and things like that. What, what we've done with a couple of the churches that are open that are bigger is um, literally mark off six feet in the hallway, one person in at a time, and they're responsible to clean before they leave. And we have supplies in there. And that actually has seemed to work. Yeah, yeah. So I saw a hand up. Yeah, let me, um, Trina, you should get the ask to unmute, go ahead. Thanks, I think that was my question, Lisa, that you were addressing and I wasn't, um, I wasn't talking about worship actually, I was talking about opening up the use of our facility mm -hmm. to actually outside small groups like our AA groups for whom meeting in person has been really crucial right. um, to their working, you know, to just how they operate. Right. and how they help support one another. So we had recently approved, the session had recently approved a, a plan to allow AA groups to come in one night a week, meet in fellowship hall, observing all of the safety protocols. They're small, I think they had under 10 people, but I still feel like, you know, I mean, I guess anything we do is exposing ourselves to risk and the people who right. come are exposing themselves to a greater risk. That's right. Um, so and how do you a, balance those things? Yeah, and it's a great question. And I know AA is a particular tricky topic because meeting in person is a critical aspect of what they do and who they are. Um, and we have had a number of churches here who are doing the same thing. We've, we've asked them to do two things, well, three things. Put out a manifesto that says, here's what needs to be true for us to open our facility for you. And, so, and, and part of that manifesto is you must be masked, you must physically distance. You know, uh, some churches have asked for forehead scan temperatures as they go in. Um, some have asked for a, a test, although again, that's a point in time. I don't actually see the point in that. They've limited access to any other part of the building. So you can meet here for this hour and that's it. Um, and then they've asked that they either contribute to a clean afterwards or they clean and leave them supplies. The other thing that we've been told to do 
and I've seen this more and more, is that the church insurance boards are getting very nervous about churches opening and, and particularly allowing smaller groups in. And so some have now started to come back and ask for waivers. So we actually, in the, in the Presbytery of Cincinnati, we already had a waiver because so many of our churches have, we call them business trees, businesses embedded within the church in some way, shape or form, or preschools or something like that. We actually have a form that indemnifies both the church and the presbytery of any harm. And now we've added COVID to that. Okay, great. We did so we in. are at the end of our hour, which I know there is more. There's, there are more questions. There's more to know. We're doing this again tomorrow, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern. So you'll have another opportunity um, to check in with Lisa if you have other questions. The Presbytery did uh, hold an insurance board webinar a little while ago. You can find that uh, video on our website under resources COVID-19. Um, we also have a webinar on things to think about before returning to the building, theological, ecclesiastical, as well as practical. I think it's fair to say that you cannot eliminate the risk right. of meeting in person for a period of time. Right. And I'm just gonna say it one more time. It is impossible to eliminate the risk of getting this disease virus if you meet in person for any length of time over 15 minutes, even yeah. if everybody is masked. So part of the decision-making process is what level of risk are you willing to endure yeah and that's a hard hard conversation to have yeah it is and i know someone asked a question about you know is there a second wave coming because there was a lot of talk about that early on and i think i think the answer is yes um it it's not necessarily going to look like the seven second wave of the 1918 spanish flu which actually i think started in kansas it didn't start in spain because this one hasn't ever gone away I mean, this virus, the wave is just going to sort of continue. What will make it worse in the winter is people won't be outdoors. They're going to be indoors. And again, that simple physics of you've got hot, dry air as opposed to, or you've got cooler, dry air as opposed to hot, humid air. So the particles are just going to go further. I think the other thing is what we're seeing now is just fatigue. People are tired of wearing masks. They see other people out doing things and they want to go do it too. You know, the the church across the street is open, darn it, why can't we be open too? And, and that's really what you're going to be struggling with um, on a continuum for probably the next 10 months or so. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you for doing it so twice. Welcome. That's fantastic. Absolutely. So again, uh, tomorrow night, we'll also go to Facebook Live and record it uh, because the content I'm sure will be a little different. Um, hard, hard decisions. Yeah. Blessings and prayers for all of you. Um, as, as you all navigate this, I'm, I'm learning how difficult this can be for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, God bless you. And thank you for uh, bringing all of your expertise into this new work. I'm so glad you failed retirement. <laughs> uh, all right, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this. Um, yeah. Be blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.